All right, the book of Colossians, uh, this is the series. Um, this is lesson number six in that series. And today, Lord willing, we'll cover chapter two, verses one to 14. Little bit of review here. Before we start, in our last lesson, uh, we uh, talked about the idea that Paul completed his explanation uh, of his main theme, that uh, Christ is first or preeminent and in the first few passages, he describes Christ as being preeminent in all relationships. In other words, in a chain, and I remember giving you this image last time, in a chain that links God to man, Jesus is every, is every link. For example, he's linked to God as one of the divine beings in the Godhead. He is linked to the creation as the force that not only brought it into existence and maintains its existence, but also the purpose for its existence. Jesus is also linked to mankind as mankind's only hope for salvation from sin and death. And then he is linked to the saved as the head of the body into which the saved are placed by God. And of course the body is the church. So you see he's He's the connection between every one of these realities, if you wish. So whatever the relationship, whatever the point of linkage, Paul shows that Jesus has the first, excuse me, has the credentials to be the first and preeminent individual at every point of contact, whether it be in the heavens or in the material world or among human beings in general, even the church. Now, into this idea or onto this idea, he adds the thought that as the minister of the gospel of Jesus Christ, Paul also has the credentials to be a teacher and a minister of the church. First, he, you know, he demonstrates Jesus' credentials, he establishes that, and now he's going to talk about his own credentials to be a teacher. Uh, he mentions his sufferings, the fact that he was appointed by Jesus, and that he teaches only the words of Jesus. These are the credentials that he has to qualify him for the task. Now, I mentioned that Paul was building his case for the preeminence of Jesus Christ in order to refute the position and the doctrine of false teachers that had you know, crept into the church. He's not teaching this thing in a vacuum. He's not just teaching this because, hey, here's a good thing to teach about Jesus. He's teaching this with a specific purpose. He's aiming this at this particular group because they are laboring under certain difficulties, certain false ideas that have been brought in by these, by these false teachers. So in the last section of chapter one, Paul goes from talking about Jesus to references about himself as a legitimate teacher of Christ's doctrines. Now we're going to see that this is a transition that Paul uses to begin a section about Jesus' teachings. So Jesus is preeminent and then he, you know, he says, and I'm a teacher of Jesus. And speaking of teaching, let me tell you about Jesus' teachings. There's always a link. He's always you know, building a bridge from one idea to another. So this leads us into the second major part of, uh, of our theme for Colossians, and that is Jesus Christ preeminent in doctrine. Preeminent in doctrine. So the first part was Jesus Christ preeminent in relationships, you know the linkage. Second part, Jesus Christ preeminent in doctrine. Um, so this chapter is going to zero in on the teachings of Jesus and their preeminent place in comparison to other religious doctrines. Now remember those false teachers, you always got to keep your eye on the ball. Even though he doesn't mention them all the time, they're always there. He's always talking about in relationship to these people here. So first, Paul shows how Christ himself is preeminent in comparison to them. Now he's going to demonstrate how Jesus' teachings are superior to their teachings as well. So in verses one to three, he begins by summarizing in the first three verses, the thought that he's going to explain in detail in the entire chapter and four verses of the next chapter. So let's read verse one, chapter two, verse one. So he says, for I want you to know how great a struggle I have on your behalf 
and for those who are at Laodicea, and for all those who have not personally seen my face. So remember, Paul is writing to people who know of him, but whom he has not personally met. There's another barrier, you know, at least if he had contact with them, if he knew them, but he's writing to people he's never met, and he's writing about important things. So this church was originally established by Epaphroditus and Timothy. We mentioned that in the introductory lesson. So Paul, while he's writing this, he's in prison in Rome for having preached the gospel, the very gospel that he's trying to protect among them with this letter. And I kind of have to think, you know, just in a little parenthetical sense, not only has he never met them, not only is he fighting people you know, that, that he has never met and never seen, but he's doing it from inside of a jail cell. You know, uh, talk about credibility issues he might have had, but he goes forward anyways and he writes his epistle. So the struggle that Paul talks about is his ministry and his imprisonment and his prayers and now this letter of instruction to people he has not met. That, that's all part of his ministry. All of this is a great effort that he makes for them as well as other churches for whom he feels a personal responsibility. The idea is, hey, I'm a teacher of the gospel and look, I'm in jail for teaching the gospel. If you're, looking at, if you're trying to find out how credible I am, how much I'm willing to give for my ministry, take a look at the postmark on this envelope here, you know, Roman jail. Okay? And I'm doing this not for myself, I'm doing it for you and other churches. Verse two, that their hearts may be encouraged, having been knit together in love, and attaining to the, all the wealth that comes from the full assurance of understanding, resulting in a true knowledge of God's mystery, that is, Christ Himself. So in this verse, Paul describes what his struggle is for, what it is that he strives for in this work that he talks about. He describes his objective for them as a series of attainments that have a final outcome. So he wants the results of his work, first of all, to be a source of encouragement to them. In other words, he wants them to be encouraged when they see the effort that he's putting forth on their behalf with the gospel. I'm in jail, I've suffered for the gospel, I'm keeping on, I'm, I'm faithful. Also, he wants, it that, um, he wants that his preaching and the teachings of Christ promote a, a loving unity among them. And then thirdly, that, by, uh, that they experience real hope. In other words, an assurance of understanding. That's real hope. He wants them to experience real hope that comes from knowing the true revelation of God and the true revelation, or the, and, and another word for this, sometimes translated in English, maybe in your Bibles, mystery. The true mystery, the true revelation of God is Jesus Christ. There is no, you know, these teachers are teaching, they know certain mysteries, they know certain things, hidden things, you know, that they'll reveal superior. And he's saying, no, 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 no. If you know Jesus as the Son of God, you know the mystery. You know the greatest knowledge that there is to know. So here Paul compresses all the information about the gospel into one word, Christ. I've mentioned that before, right? He explains things at length and then as he goes on, he compresses them into words like grace or salvation. Here, Christ. In other words, if you believe in Christ, you have the key to understanding all of the Old Testament as well as all the teachings of the apostles. Because remember, the false teachers were saying, hey, we, we got more knowledge here. We have some later revelations. We have things that you don't know and that, the, you know, that Paul, he doesn't know, that we're willing to share with you if you kind of follow us. And so in response to them, doesn't even mention them, but in response to them, he said, look, if, if you know Christ, you have the mystery, you have all the knowledge, you have the key that unlocks everything. Well, what's everything? Well, not the key that unlocks uh, you know, math you know, or how many stars there are in the sky. No, the key that unlocks the mysteries of God's word, the Old Testament, the New Testament, what it means and so on and so forth. In verse three, he says, in whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. So he repeats the idea in verse three where he explains that all wisdom and knowledge, again, all wisdom and knowledge about God's plan, about the salvation of man, 
all this wisdom and knowledge uh, is contained in Jesus' life and teachings and cross and resurrection. It's all there. It's not earthly wisdom about science or math. I mentioned that before. It's heavenly spiritual wisdom that pertains to man's condition and man's salvation. So as I said, Paul begins by stating that as far as uh, uh, wisdom and knowledge and teaching is concerned, Jesus is the embodiment of all revelation, something that man, regardless of his intelligence, cannot compete with. It doesn't matter how smart you are, you can't figure out Jesus Christ unless it's, unless it's revealed to you by God. No matter how smart you are, you can't figure out the plan, God's plan of salvation you know, by sending His Son, vicarious atonement, all those things. You can't figure that out through wisdom and knowledge. And we have the proof of that because the Jews, probably the most educated nation of their time, they didn't figure it out, they rejected Him. So in verse four or five, he says, I say this so that no one will delude you with persuasive argument. For even though I am absent in body, nevertheless I am with you in spirit, rejoicing to see your good discipline and the stability of your faith in Christ. So Paul states that he has established Jesus' teachings as revelation, so that they will not be persuaded to abandon these teachings from other form of doctrine. Remember the false doctrine that's swirling around them? Persuasive argument is the manner in which these false teachers were drawing brethren away through arguing, through smooth talk. They, did, they didn't have a new revelation, but they were smooth talkers. They were good debaters. They would use these tactics to fool and confuse and delude the brethren and thus make them begin to doubt the gospel. So even though he warns them, Paul's quick to also commend them for their personal discipline. In other words, they have self-control. And I don't mean self-control as to food or sex or whatever. No, no, they have self-control because they're, they're remaining steady in their faith. They're not, you know, every wind of doctrine, right? They're not bouncing around from one idea. They're steady, they're holding steady. They're being attacked, but they're holding steady. And he commends them for holding steady in the faith. So they were being penetrated by false teachers, but so far they were holding on to the truth. Even though Paul is far away, he rejoices with them in this fact. Verse six and seven, he continues, Therefore, as you have received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in Him, having been firmly rooted and now being built up in Him and established in your faith just as you were instructed and overflowing with gratitude. So the best way to prove doctrine is to live it. So they have been taught about Christ, about His teachings. Now they need to practice that teaching in their everyday lives if it is really to take effect. You know, Christianity is not just head knowledge. Not just you know, what you find out in your head, what you can figure out in your head. Christianity is life knowledge. You have to put it into practice. You have to test it. So they've been, they've been well taught, he says here, rooted. And they've been encouraged. Now they need to put into practice those teachings that dealt especially with faithfulness and thanksgiving. Now that they're being challenged, now that things are becoming difficult, they're being tested to see if their faith is true. And Paul encourages to hang in there. You know, they said that the only you know, two things that are true in life, the old saying, you know, death and taxes, you know, which, yeah, <laughs> of course, death and taxes. But for Christians, there's a third thing that's true. And that is, if you're a faithful Christian, you'll be tested. You'll be tested. You may not be tested every day. You may hit a nice smooth patch there that'll go on. You know, it may go on for months, years. Nice smooth patch, you know, just normal life. You know. But sooner or later, you'll be tested in some way. And I've realized in my own life, the best and most effective first step when you are tested is the realization that you're being tested. Oh, 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 oh. This, this is what this is. 
I don't know about you, but I tend to have a bit of a temper when it comes, oh, you know, not now, you know. Things were going so smooth, you know, why does this have to happen? God, what's wrong with you? Not now, can't you see I'm busy? Can't you see I got all this other stuff going on? That's usually my first reaction. But if, uh, if the teaching is any good, if my spirit is right, eventually it'll come. Oh, wait, 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 wait. Oh, oh this is the day. Oh, this is what this is. And the moment that I realize, oh, this is what this is, it doesn't make the thing easier, but it puts it into context. Okay, I know what this is. I know what I need to be doing. Not whining and moaning and complaining and being angry at God, angry at so-and-so. I need to realize this, this is what he said would happen to me. Verse eight. He says, see to it that no one takes you captive through philosophy and empty deception according to the tradition of men, according to the elementary principles of the world, rather than according to Christ. So verse eight is another summary statement where Paul will briefly outline a new thought and then take several verses to explain in detail what he has just said. Again, he uses a compression word or the compression word, Christ, according to Christ. Christ is the standard. In this case, not simply the person of Christ, but the teachings and the commands and the examples of Christ. This is the standard by which all things need to be judged. Now, the objective of the false teachers is slavery. Slavery to their doctrine, slavery to their religious authority. Christ sets one free from ignorance and fear and slavery, this kind of slavery. Their tactics are the teaching of ideas and concepts from a variety of sources other than Christ. And Paul mentions a few, philosophy or concepts that are really an empty show or deception based on lofty notions about man-made rules concerning the way the world works. We call it philosophy today. Not all philosophy. But much of philosophy is what? Explaining the world without God. Explaining the world without God. Now, during this time, there was speculation that the angels somehow controlled the basic elements, fire, rain, thunder, so on and so forth, and that these should be worshiped and they should provide some sort of oversight, the worship of angels, so these Judaizers, these false teachers, were not necessarily educated men, but they were making a show of their learning by putting forth these, quote, new ideas based on man-made philosophies involving angels and the manipulation of nature. Well, the manipulation of nature, you know what that is, that's magic. You try to manipulate the unseen world so that the unseen world will give you advantage in the seen world. And from this new worldview, they were inventing rules for living, which robbed the Colossians of their freedom in Christ. The, one of the reasons I love this epistle, me personally, is the fact that this is the clarion call of freedom for Christians. You know Colossians, if you know Coloss the book of Colossians, no one will ever imprison you, you know, intellectually or religiously, as these people uh, were in danger of being at that time. So Paul says that the Colossians should not be held responsible to any teaching that does not have as its source the teachings of Christ. Verses nine to 15, he's going to give four reasons why this should be so. Why should you not ascribe to any other teaching other than the teachings of Christ? Four reasons. Number one, Jesus is divine. He says, for in Him all the fullness of deity dwells in bodily form. Anybody who says to you, where does it say in the Bible that Jesus you know, is the Son of God, that Jesus is divine, right? Colossians 2.9. Memorize it, Colossians 2.9. For in Him all the fullness of deity dwells in bodily form. You can't make that say something else. <laughs> it says what it says. 
So the teaching of Jesus, therefore, is the teaching of God. Why? Because Jesus is God in human form. To follow His teaching is to follow God's teaching, and it shouldn't be replaced with the false doctrine of these other teachers, no matter how spiritual they seem to be. Secondly, four reasons why they should remain free. Two, they are complete in Christ. Verse 10a, and in Him, this one in whom the fullness of deity dwells, and in Him you have been made complete. By connection to Christ, who is divine, they have access to all that divinity offers. And what does divinity offer? Revelation, wisdom, salvation, blessings, eternal life. You know, we can just list them all. They have no need of additional teaching, additional saving. They have everything they need spiritually in relationship to Christ. This is why we don't need Mohammed, he brings nothing to the table. Well, and, he, and you know what, if we live long enough, I mean, if we do live long enough, there'll be some other person come in. It's always the same thing. Someone comes up and has a special knowledge. Oh, they had a vision, they had a revelation, they got some new news about God in some way, and they, they attract followers. You know, they're always saying, a billion people you know, follow Mohammed, so what? So what? A couple of billion people are atheists. Does that make them correct? It's not a numbers game. Jesus told us the way is narrow. If he would have said, you know, oh, the way, the way to eternal life, the way to Christ is very broad, very wide. Well, okay, I get a little nervous. You know. But he didn't say that, he says it's narrow and few, few find it, few. That was back in the first century, in the fifth century it was true, in the ninth century, in the sixteenth century, in the twenty-first century, and it'll still be true in the twenty-fifth century if, if we last that long. If Jesus doesn't return, don't you know that by the twenty-fifth century there'll be some new guru, some new religious leader, some new prophet that'll you know, pop up and, and say, oh, I, I've got the knowledge. I've got, I've got what you're missing. And yet 2,000 years ago, Paul said, no, 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 no. You're complete in Christ. It's done. It's done. No need of additional teaching, additional saving. Everything you need concerning your salvation, your eternal life, everything you need, you have it in Christ. Four reasons they are free. Number three, Jesus is ruler of all. Verse 10b, and He is the head over all rule and authority. Notice here he's not saying He's the head of the church. He's the head over all rule and authority. One day Mr. Putin will answer to Him. And the, the dictator in North Korea will answer to Him. As will Abraham Lincoln answer to him, as will uh, uh, President Obama answer to him. Because if I'm not mistaken here, it says, and he is the head over all rule, all authority, from the president of the most powerful nation on earth to the leader of a tribe in some you know, developing nation. All rulers, all authority answer to Him. So by saying head over all rule and authority, Paul says in effect that Jesus is Lord of Lords, King of Kings, sovereign over everything. If Jesus is their head as, or Lord, then there is no need for another head. No need for anyone else to take that position as the Judaizers were trying to do. Remember, keep your eye on them. That's what they were trying to do. They were trying to become the leaders, the head over these Christians. And they were doing it with talk of angels and secret knowledge and so on and so forth. You have everything you need. Most times people you know, who are converted away from Christianity to some other religion, usually it's because they don't even know their own religion. They don't really know about Christianity. Number four, Jesus is the Savior. 
Finally, Paul explains the most important reason why they should only follow the teachings of Christ. He is their savior. You know, the Judaizers, the false teachers, they were boasting that their circumcision and their adherence to laws on feasts and food made them superior, made them holier than their Gentile counterparts who simply trusted in Christ. And thus they were worthy to be obeyed and followed. So Paul shows that the salvation they have in Christ has a greater value than the mere boasting in circumcision made by the Judaizers. For example, circumcision, you know, it was of God, yes. It was the sign of the promise that God made to Abraham, which Jesus fulfilled with his appearance. But these men were using it as a kind of a badge to boast of their religious superiority. Those who are circumcised, they're with us. And these people, we have the secret knowledge. We're the superior ones. So let's read how he says it. And in him, he says, you were also circumcised with the circumcision made without hands in the removal of the body of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ, having been buried with him in baptism, in which you were also raised up with him through faith in the working of God, who raised him from the dead. So fleshly circumcision removed an actual piece of flesh from the body as a sign of a spiritual promise of God. Paul says that through Christ, what is cut away is the body of flesh, meaning the old person of sin. Remember, I've also mentioned to you that in the Bible many times they refer to the same thing with different terms. Well, here he's using the idea of the body of flesh. In another place he's talking, he uses the same, he uses a different term, you know, the old person of sin, the old man. In other words, the old man is taken away, is separated from you. The old nature that loved and served sin, this is removed by Christ through his efforts on our behalf. He then describes the physical or the historical moment when this spiritual circumcision takes place, and that's baptism. You know, physical circumcision took place eight days after the, uh, the male child was born. We read about that in Genesis 17, verses 10 to 14. There was a specific time, historical moment, when that circumcision took place, eight days after birth. Well, uh, 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 baptism here is not just a promise or a symbol, it's the actual moment when the old man is removed and the new person is raised. It's where and how our faith in Christ is properly expressed. Paul says that what happens to us in baptism is verified and guaranteed, how? By the resurrection of Jesus. I, I mean, I'm baptized because I believe and I obey Jesus. And I have hope in what He's promised me. And why is my hope secure? Well, because he raised, He's raised from the dead. And He's told me, you see what happened to me? That's going to happen to you. That's what will happen to you. So Paul says that what happens to us in baptism, again, guaranteed by the resurrection of Jesus, we are raised and renewed in baptism by the same godly power that raised Jesus from the dead. Paul talks about that in Romans chapter eight. Continues here to say, when you were dead in your transgressions and the uncircumcision of your flesh, he made you alive together with him, having forgiven us all our transgressions, having canceled out the certificate of debt consisting of decrees against us, which was hostile to us, and he has taken it out of the way, having nailed it to the cross. So in these two verses, Paul explains the value and the importance of this spiritual circumcision that we receive at baptism. It transforms them from death to life. He equates uncircumcision with being spiritually dead. In the same way in the Old Testament, right? If you weren't circumcised, you were not part of the people of God. And so you were spiritually dead. You, you were not an inheritor of the promises. Well, he explains that they were spiritually dead because they were guilty of transgressing God's law, God's decrees, which said, in effect, if you sin, you die. So Paul says that they were made alive through the power of forgiveness. 
And what this forgiveness does is cancel or pay the debt of sin which constantly accused and, con uh, and condemned them before God. You know, in a trial, the prosecutor gets up, right? He reads what the person is accused of. This person is accused of this and that, you know, murder, aggression, and reads all the things, and then, then they bring the proof. Well, Paul is saying, in a trial-like sense, our sins, our transgressions, they're the prosecutor. They're, con they're constantly accusing us of, of, of being guilty. That, that we, we have another way of, of, of referring to that. We call that a guilty conscience. Our conscience is always accusing us. So he says here, the cross of Christ, it cancels that debt, it pays that off, it defends us. So Jesus took all of these sins and atoned for them once and for all so that they no longer stood between God and man. For the Christian who has a conscience that's accusing him, only two things can be true about that. One, he's actually guilty of some, he or she, guilty of something and needs to kind of repent and make it right. Or Satan is simply using his past to torture him, to make him doubt the effectiveness of the cross. And most of the times with Christians, the second thing is usually what's going on. Because if Satan can shake our faith in the cross of Christ, well, he might be able to bring us back into the, into the world. So the graphic imagery is that the sins, which he describes as a certificate of indebtedness, a bill, an invoice, he says it's been nailed to the cross along with his own body, with not Paul's body, but Christ's body. So Paul explains that the spiritual circumcision that takes place at baptism was made possible by Christ's sacrifice on the cross and received by them through faith at baptism. So we go into the water as sinners condemned by the law that accuses us of our sins and two things happen in that watery grave. Number one, come on. Number one, the bill of certificate or the certificate of debt, or the mortgage, whatever. The thing that we owe God for our sins is paid for by the cross of Christ. It's at the point of baptism that forgiveness for our sins takes effect for us. And then number two, the old nature of sin, the old man of sin is cut away and we're given a new spiritual nature. It's at the point of baptism that we receive the Holy Spirit who enables us to live as spiritual people. Baptism is the objective expression of our subjective faith in Christ. I have faith in Christ, that's subjective. I can see that, I know that, but you know, no one else does. But when I accept baptism, that's the objective expression of my subjective faith. God gives us something physical, visible to do, not just for other people, but for us. Those moments that I feel the worst when Satan is just accusing and accusing. And usually you know, I've messed up in one thing and, and he takes advantage of just say, oh boy, you know, now he's going he's to pull out all the old, you know, the old, all the old accusations. Well, you, know, you remember you did this, this, this. You, you're starting to do the same old. Those moments there, that's, that's when I feel at my lowest. But I can remember November 1977 I said, I do believe that Jesus is the Son of God and I was buried in the waters of baptism. I remember that objective reality and the promise that God said that in those waters of baptism, you're forgiven. So when the Satan puts up you know, all his stuff, I draw the image of November 1977 and I put it here to cancel that out. You know, Peter explains the same phenomenon, but in a much shorter way in Acts 2.38, right? Repent, let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus. What for? The forgiveness of your sins. And what else? And you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. What's the gift of the Holy Spirit? The Spirit living in you. The Spirit now giving you the power to live spiritual lives. All right, so we're going to continue with this passage next week. Too long to do it in one shot. In the meantime, remember that the importance and necessity of baptism is not, baptism is not something that was invented by the Church of Christ. Some people say, oh yeah, Church of Christ, you people, you baptize. No, 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 no. No, the Bible asks us to baptize. We're just trying to do what the Bible says. So remember, Jesus, Peter, and Paul, 
each emphasized that baptism was the moment that salvation and forgiveness and regeneration took place. We, we in the Church of Christ, we only emphasize what the New Testament emphasizes. All right, that's it for this morning. Thank you for your attention. We will continue and read ahead, please. Read ahead in Colossians.